Welcome to The Moms I Know with Sheila Walsh Denton and Maria Anderson Farner. Two moms on a mission to reclaim childhood and take you from surviving to thriving on your parenting journey. The Moms I Know is your go to source for motivation, inspiration, and resources, and real conversation about motherhood and parenting with intention. Thank you for being a part of our community. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Never let a problem to be solved become more important than a person to be loved. Thomas S. Monson. Hi, this is Sheila. And this is Maria. And we want to welcome you to The Moms I Know. Beautiful quote. Um, So today we are welcoming Roxanne Bybee. Roxanne is a dear friend of mine and also a mother of five beautiful boys. She and her husband have a thriving business as essential oil educators, and they live in the foothills in California and have been creating an incredible life for themselves and their boys, uh, living and learning together on the land and also doing quite a bit of travel. And so Uh, Roxanne, you have been a mentor to me, and so I really appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you so very much. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. And that is such a beautiful quote to start our conversation with, because this is what Sheila and I are all about, is this idea of family culture, where we are really cultivating this togetherness where we are really looking at the individual needs of every single child. And with five boys, I know that you have really um, mastered that. And, and so we wanted to t- talk to you today a little bit. Uh, first off, we're, as we were recording this, we are in the midst of a global pandemic. So life has changed for all of us. This recording you know, will be going out in the next couple of weeks, but hopefully people will be listening to these for years to come as we have podcast episodes on so many aspects of parenting. So I just want to acknowledge that we are in a very unusual play, you know, state right now with these unknowns, these uncertainties. And so first off, I want to see, you know, how are you all doing? We are managing and we're in about, let's see, our second full week of um, back to homeschooling. And, um, because that was where I started in my schooling with my children, but, um, so it's, it, we're adapting, you know, it's, it's, some days are better than others. That's all I'll say. <laughs> we're all adapting, aren't we? And so I, I wanted, we wanted to interview you because you have this perspective of you homeschooled your children and then you sent them to school at a certain point. I think, you know, your lives transitioned with work, with business, with five boys. And then you did send them to your local Waldorf school, correct? Correct. Yeah. And now there's the transition back home to <laughs> homeschooling again, or what we call family schooling, you know. And, and what's so interesting is, you know, we started this whole path of working with um these podcasts to help parents make healthy choices around all aspects of family life. And now we're really working at helping people understand if they choose to homeschool, how we can be of support to them. And now everybody's homeschooling because of the need to be staying at home with this pandemic. And when this is all over, some families will return their children to school. But I think some families may have seen a different way of, of, of possibility And so we'd love for you to talk about that transition from homeschooling back to school, and then maybe a little bit about the schooling back to home, if you would. Absolutely. Um, The first thing I will say is that as a mom, a homeschooling mom, I I had a very high standard for myself, and I constantly failed my own standards, shall we say. Um, and so I never really felt like I was doing excellent as a homeschool mom um, because I wanted this ideal that I guess is probably impossible, you know. Um, but it, I, we did have occasionally, we had some tutors and things to help out once I started a, a business that I needed to spend more time on and, 
and things like that. But in the end, my children really, they weren't progressing like they could have been. And so that was what we did, decided. Well, my husband actually was the one who looked at Waldorf as an option. And I, I don't do super well with change. <laughs> so, so I was, I was not the person looking for another option. I was just kind of like, we'll just limp along in this status quo of imperfection, you know? And he's like, our kids need more. They need more challenge. They need, you know, to be developed. They need something different. And, and so for us, you know, we found a Waldorf school within 15 minutes of our home. Some people have to drive an hour, you know, but, but I will say that, um, that transition was, was not an easy one. You know, some people might say, Oh, it was just like so great as a parent be able to just say, Oh good. Now someone else's responsibility, not mine anymore. Right. Well, when you, if you're familiar at all with Waldorf, there's a lot of different things they do that, that are not necessarily standard. One being like cursive or the fact that they write their own textbooks, you know, and we hadn't necessarily been doing homeschool in that way. Um, and so, so for my children that were, especially in the older grades transitioning, I had a sixth grader going in. He didn't know any cursive. His class had been studying Spanish, violin. They'd been studying all these things. So his um, emotional landscape was, it was very difficult. I mean, I remember multiple times crying with him, trying to do his pages and him, him making a mistake and tearing it up and, you know, starting all over and it's like nine o'clock at night. Right. And I'm just like, Oh my gosh, what are we get doing? You know, and I'm crying, he's crying, you know, it's just, Oh, so the transition moving to Waldorf was actually, was actually really hard. It wasn't just this easy peasy, especially those older grades, you know? So if you're going to do it, know that it will be worth it, but that there will be an adjustment period. You know, it's not, it's not going to be all roses and, and don't give up just because it's not easy. I, um, oh, I get teary thinking about it because I asked that son who is now 17. I asked him at the end of that sixth grade year when he had, you know, looking at his work at the beginning of the year and comparing it to his work at the end of the year. And I said, did you ever think that you could do this? And he said, no, I didn't. But now I know my capacity and I, I really have the capacity to achieve, you know, and it was, it was so powerful for him to have that lesson. It was, um, as a mom, you know, it was, it was definitely, I saw his capacity firsthand change, you know? And so that's what I would say is like, I think I was not a very demanding homeschooling mother. And, um, I didn't really want to be, cause I just didn't want that conflict. Um, but they got a, a sense of like a positive peer pressure from their Waldorf community that really spawned them into a no, a new stage of wanting to excel. And so, yeah, I can't say enough about how awesome and Waldorf's just like any other school. It's going to have its imperfections, but, but I just really have seen my kids thrive. And, and so if you, you know, haven't looked into Waldorf and you're not happy with where your situation is, it's a great place to, to look. Um, you know, now being home, like you asked me to respond on that, it's luckily Waldorf does give them a nice um, framework. And, and so I feel like as that has helped us being at home, having that framework. And it sounds like that's what you're offering to people is this framework. And I feel like if I had had a better framework when I first homeschooled, it might have felt uh, a little bit more like my ideal and a little bit more like I was uh, achieving what I wanted. Um, and so I love that, um, that you have a framework and that you're teaching that and, and exposing people to that because I think that as, as homeschool parents, we need that safety, that sense of like someone's holding us and, and something's holding this, this process that's constantly moving, right? So, so that would be my comment is that it's, it's going okay. There's Waldorf traditionally has zero technology. Um, and so this has been really interesting because we are the sixth and seventh. I have a, excuse me, a seventh and an eighth grader right now um, that are distance learning with Waldorf uh, through this pandemic. And, and because they're already somewhat familiar with technology, it's not been too hard on them. Um, but the first grader is, I have a first grader who's, um, you know, not allowed to look at his stuff that I'm getting right. And I'm having to take all of his stuff and digest it and then, and then give it to him. And so that part, I'm feeling like I'm getting like a crash course in being a Waldorf teacher. Um, so it's, it's really, it's, it's a time for being patient with each other. I'll tell you, man. Woo. Uh, you have, you shared so many nuggets in there that I want to t kind of touch into. Um, first off, you know, for, for those of you who are listening to this and trying to figure out where you're going to go with these next steps, 
you know, our children went through a variety of homeschool and Waldorf education and then independent study and study abroad. And what you, your story about your sixth grader just touches my heart so deeply because what you expressed was that the struggle was worth it. And also that he had that intrinsic capability. He had that inner strength. And that is something that we've seen over and over, Sheila and I, with these students who are allowed to have a more gentle childhood. Uh, uh, you know, we're the guardians of childhood here. And so we're advocating for this, this slower pace, this timing. And then as the children get older and they, they choose to go into some sort of educational system or you choose a more rigorous homeschool curriculum, they can step into that when they are ready because they have this firm foundation and your story just illustrates that so beautifully. So, and you know, I can, obviously the emotion there, it's so hard when our children are struggling and as mothers, we want to fix everything for mm -hmm. them and we can't. And sometimes we just have to go through that. So I really appreciate that you said it's worth the struggle, whatever we choose. And Sheila and I are really advocates for, you know, different types of, I mean, every family is different. And so we're, what is going to work for one family is not going to work for another. And so, you know, our family, we loved Waldorf education. A lot of ch families are choosing to homeschool through the Waldorf pedagogy. Other families are choosing more of a Montessori approach or the Charlotte Mason. And, you know, in our ebook, we cover all of these different options that you have. But you also pointed out this need for support. And that's you know, when we started homeschooling, it was not a uh, immediately by choice with uh, our oldest, well, the middle child, basically, um, my oldest son. And we kind of came to it because of need. And we, we figured it out. We muddled through, but we did have mentors along the way. And so Sheila and I have had mentors. You know, Sheila's children were in my homeschool program. So I know I was a mentor for her. She's been a mentor for me with so much information throughout the years with nutrition and health and wellness and, and beyond. And, and so, you know, we, we're all sort of mentors for each other in different ways. And, you know, Roxanne, you've been a mentor for me with this essential oil business and, and how to use them. And then also just watching you raise these five boys and then being, you know, a, a friend as well. And so we need that support. And yet we, we also can, Homeschool, you said imperfectly, and I love that you use that word because we're saying, you know, yes, it's going to be messy. And for those of you who are doing it now, not by choice, or for those of you who are doing it by choice, you know, it's messy. It doesn't always look ideal. And we're all in tears together sometimes. But, you know, whether you've sent your children to public school or private school or homeschool, there's going to be those moments no matter what we do. And so we just have to be in this space together. So uh, I really appreciate so much in you know, all of what you said and just this striving together and that then they can draw on these inner strengths. So, so thank you for all of that. Um, the, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the, the younger one's journey right now of, you know, being homeschooled, but then going to school and then coming back. So as, as you know, uh, being exposed to Waldorf and I hadn't really studied much this concept of rhythm um, but I, I really, it's just been kind of pounded into my head over and over, you know, uh, by Waldorf. And, um, and so for those parents who may not know what that refers to, it's just that, that we literally need rhythm in our lives and it needs to be, it doesn't mean that we have to be perfect at it, but, but that certain markers and things that you do help your children to fill a rhythm and a safety um, that comes from that. And so, and they're such masters at how they do it at Waldorf. And, and so I'm trying to remember that, you know, that this is why they have like a morning burst and these different um, things that they do that help the children to fill this, this kind of a rhythm. And they also ex try to do what's called like an in-breath and an out-breath um, with their coursework, if you will. I meaning your children might be doing something like drawing and then they might go outside and walk or something like that. And so the in-breath would be that inside uh, component where the child is being more still. And then the out-breath is the more active. Um, and I'm probably not describing that correctly since I'm not a Waldorf educator, but you get the picture. So that, that's been um, probably what I'm noticing the most is that my first grader really needs that rhythm. And this new pandemic lifestyle we have, it's 
really not very rhythmic, you know, and he can't count on things, you know, because every day something is massively changing. And um, so, so that has been bringing up a lot of emotion and, um, and I'm hoping that as this could be a very long-term situation for all of us, that I can put some of those pieces of rhythm in place so that he, he has a, a more of a sense of security that he knows what he can count on. And, and he like, his behavior is so much better if he can like know what to count on, but he misbehaves like crazy as soon as it's just, you know, all up in the air and there's no rhythm to his life. I'm so glad you pointed that out because Sheila and I have an episode about rhythm and routine and, and we've, you know, we've, we've spoken about this before. And so you articulated that so nicely that the children, when they have that in place and it can be, you know, rhythm can look different for different families, but when you have that, it really, when my children were in Waldorf school, they always said that rhythm takes the place of discipline, that if children have this rhythm to count on, then they can settle into it and their, their little nervous systems know what to expect. And so you said that, that his behavior correlates kind of with that. And so in the midst of this pandemic, and you know, we don't know how long that we'll be staying at home with our children, with our families, with our spouses, uh, you know, or, or, you know, for some people it's, it's more isolating. And for some it's, it's this cozy family time. And also every child is responding differently to this. There are the children that are, you know, thrilled to be home with their parents. And there's other children that just are missing their schoolmates and missing, yeah. especially the teenagers, you know, missing that. And mm-hmm. so I'm thinking that, that maybe we can go a little bit into this piece of talking about the teenagers, but through this piece of rhythm, and maybe you and Sheila can weigh in a little bit because I know you both have the teenagers right now. And this concept of how do we create rhythm when our life has gone arrhythmic, so to speak? You know, luckily, the that core, um, I guess I would say, rhythm that my children established by being in a Waldorf program, even my, because I currently have a 17-year-old that's in a public school, and... Um, And that wasn't necessarily our first choice, but it happened to be, it was the closest option for us. And he, that's where he wanted to go. And, and so, you know, once again, open your mind that, that like, it's may not look like you expect, you know, your end of your schooling journey may look very different than you thought, you know, but um, (laughs) she was kind of like, yeah, Um, she probably has had more success with um, keeping her teens off of technology. But I feel like, it is really hard to separate those two things right now. Our lives are so technological. And I mean, obviously we're doing this call on Zoom. Thank heavens to technology where else we couldn't do it, you know. So there are lots of blessings that can come from it. But we have just had to, with the with our older group, we've really had to, now that we're at home, put a very clear um, set of parameters on their rhythm with technology. And And I would say that this is like, the one topic that we talk about more than anything being at home is this topic because it is, you know, internet and just access to all the things is, is really hard for people to have control over. And, um, and so, so that's really been what's helped. And I don't know what, what's working well for Sheila and some families have absolutely, they have no technology at home. And I, my hat is off to them because that would just make it so much easier. You don't even have to discuss it, you know, but, but we don't, we don't have it that way. So. Yeah, um, sorry, I have kids coming in, in and out. Um, the it's it's time right now for a whole new rhythm, you know, with like the the less the less judgment, the less like we just have to. You touched on it right when you started, Roxanne. Was um, some days are better than others, you know, and I just think like that's my my mantra is just like let be, let let go, let let you know it is what it is, and technology is that thing too. It's no better here in my house, and it's you know my kids are on it. And, you know, I'm just grateful they weren't on it until they were freshmen in high school, (laughs) you know, but, but for my two olders, but my younger ones, they're on it more. So it's like when there's a tech question, ask the youngest because she knows. And I think that's the the times, but it's, it's such a hard, I mean, Maria is, um, you know, it's, it's not part of, it hasn't been part of your reality, but I feel like this technology piece for parents now with teens and younger it's the one, it's the biggest thing on our minds because we, we know 
I don't want to say it rots the brain, but we, we know the effect. We've seen the research and you're in Waldorf, so you see the research even more so, right? But what, what do we do? And so I've really tried to be aware and conscious of stepping back and just some days are better than others. And, you know, and, and putting structure around what's important. So that outside time, that's important. So let's emphasize that. Let's emphasize the family meal times. Important. Emphasize that. So, you know, and then the learning time and stuff like that. But it's hard because they're on their Zoom classes. I'm on my Zoom or I'm on my business calls. Um, and I just think we have to just, just give it the space and the grace and let it let it go and and try to be easy i don't know if, if your son's a senior or is he is he a junior he is actually a sophomore because when you go into the waldorf program and you're a little right. behind right they kind of want you to so he started under his current grade in waldorf and that which was actually helpful in the end but he didn't like it at first <laughs> yeah well, i bet <laughs> yeah so my my son's 17 and he's graduating you know and so that's a whole other like layer of parent being i'm sorry you're not getting this how can i compensate in some way you know because you're and, and and then trying to remove myself from that as well because i can't what can i do <laughs> it's, it's a global pandemic i'm inside too it's hard it's hard as a mom right now and yet you've both touched on this aspect of this generation, these young people that are dealing with this from their perspective, this is going to be, you know, this adaptability, resilience, flexibility, grit, determination, perseverance. You know, when I think of Sheila's children, I always think of perseverance, you know, that um, they've persevered through so many things, you know, our children have had to persevere. And when we come up against these obstacles, when we come up against these challenges, whether it's you know, going from homeschooling to the classroom or coming from the classroom home or entering something at different grades or having to struggle through, that helps to create character. It helps to build character. And so when we, when we shelter our children too much from life's challenges, we're not allowing these growing experiences. And now we're all being faced with these new challenges and paradigms. I remember Roxanne talking with James even a couple of years ago about how, you know, the, the computers and the social media and all of that was starting to infiltrate into your home and how challenging it was. And I remember for us, you know, yes, our children are a little older, but when video games started to come out, and, you know, we had no television at all. And then these things start to insidiously creep into our homes. And now look at how technology in our, you know, staying at home lives has become the lifeline. So we appreciate it for the tool that it is but also as parents still have to create this structure, this rhythm, these boundaries. And, and Sheila and Roxanne both have talked about, you know, this outside time. And Sheila, I love the way that you brought in the meals. And so when we can, instead of making the technology, you know, the bad thing that we have to kind of limit, let's look at expanding the, you know, the outdoor time, the meal times, the family times, the games times. So Roxanne, I know, you know, you you and your husband are fortunate to live out in the country and so how, you know, that whole idea of outside, how have you incorporated that in? You know, it, it's nice because we, the schedule is somewhat opened up, right? So um, I, I, we can be out more, you know, and so we're just, we're trying to hike and um, go on walks, even if, you know, um, even if it's not some massive adventure, it's just the fact that it's not raining and they can get out or whatever. It's, um, it's a change. Once again, it's that whole in breath, out breath, even though the older kids may not say it as such, it, it does make them feel renewed and able to, um, especially where we all feel a little locked in our homes, you know? Um, so even if you live somewhere where you don't have that, we do have land around us and we're able to walk and, and, and see nature. Um, but even if you can just go outside to get the fresh air, you know, and um, if you're in the city, then hopefully it's freshish, you know, but, um, but I, I would say that has been really a lifeline for them. And like yesterday, my, all my boys, there's a pond that is near our property and they went and they took this raft that is not the greatest raft, but they took it and, you know, managed to kind of go around this little pond that is like really overgrown and stuff. And they clipped some, you know, clipped some branches and did some stuff. And, and we asked at the end of the day, what, while we were having meal time, we were asking, you know, what was your best moment today? And, and like all of the boys that had gone to the pond were like the pond. You know? <laughs> so, so it, it is, um, 
it feels very much like it's, it's honing you in on what really is important. And, and the simple things I always have been wanting my kids to have this pleasure in simple things. And it's like, kind of my prayers are being answered because I, that was not happening in their very tech slash simulated world, you know, and, and it's kind of feels like I have moments of seeing that, you know, where they like enjoy the simple things right now. That's beautiful. That's, that's such a perfect thing to kind of wrap this up with is just this concept of simplifying. I, I read a quote the other day, you know, simplicity, patience, compassion. It's the Lao Tzu. That's what we need right now. And so we have a lot of episodes about that whole concept of simplifying our lives. And we're all being forced to really look at what matters most. So thank you for sharing that with us. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we end this? No, I think for me as a mom that had homeschooled and then I thought I will be a homeschool mom forever. And I'm like super loyal to whatever idea I come an expectation I have for my life. And it was really hard for me to like change my perspective of like, Oh, my kids are going to school. Like I actually had like a kind of a complex, a little bit like I'm a failure that I'm sending my kids to school. Cause like the best moms really are the homeschool moms. Like they're the most amazing because they do it all, you know, like that kind of a which is super stupid. And when I say it out loud, it sounds really ridiculous, but, but I had to kind of get over myself, if you will, and kind of go, it's okay. You know, that I put my kids in school or say that I chose to bring somebody out, you know, or whatever, like just giving yourself that grace of like my home, my homeschool slash regular school, whatever the journey may look like, it's not going to be what you expect most likely. And to just love yourself through that and be like, it's okay, you know? And some of you moms are probably like, that's really easy for you, but maybe I'm talking to the one who's like me that that wasn't easy for. And so hopefully you can just go, it's okay, whatever is will be. And and we can, we don't have to like, if say that you're looking at Waldorf, you don't have to go into Waldorf thinking, I'm going to be Waldorf forever. You can go in just knowing that, you know, I could try this for a year and see if it works for this child. And if it doesn't, then that's okay. You know, no pressure. (laughs) <laughs> I think that last bit is one of the best home pieces of homeschooling advice is, and you said it at the beginning, I'm the day by day thing, but like, you, you, okay, you have this vision Waldorf, but that, wait, it doesn't work. You can switch. You can turn it, turn a different direction. Right. And that's, that's the biggest gift in homeschooling. I think that's the biggest gift for homeschooling moms now at homeschool moms or whatever like, that you can have that you can change direction change the vibration, change it whenever, whenever you want. Thank you, Roxanne. You bet. Yeah, thank you so much. We're all being faced with just new possibilities. And so we just encourage you all to take this time, think about what matters most in life. And Roxanne, thank you so much for being with us here today. My pleasure. God bless. Thanks for joining us today for the Moms I Know. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. To get the show notes and resources mentioned in today's episode, visit themomsiknow.com. For information on Maria's programs, visit thefutureoffamily.com. And for information on Sheila's programs, visit purplebeatfamily.com. Don't forget to subscribe and rate us on iTunes and follow us on Instagram at themomsiknowpodcast. Until next time, have a joyful family journey.